love than this. He said, Ye are my friend if ye do what whatsoever I command you. You see, one way you can be my friend, that is if you do the thing that I tell you to do. And you see, henceforth, I call you not servant. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friend for all these that I have heard of my father, I have made known unto you. Now, if you observe, I move down, way down to verse 15. And uh, as we read from verse even 12, down to 15, which I think I had already studied, but then we could uh, look at those things that were mentioned right there. Because we will not be going very far. We are just going to go as far as 17. And then we will stop. But before we get to 16, we have some questions to answer right there in verse 15 and uh, Say 15, not even 16, but verse 14 and 15. Verse 14 and 15, he said, uh, Ye are my friend, if ye do whatsoever I command you. And he said, Henceforth I call you not servant, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends for all these that I have heard of my father I have made known unto you. So then, <clears throat> though we are God's servants, we are also his friend. Right? In fact, he said, from now on, henceforth, or oh, from now on, you will be my friend, or I will call you friend. That's what he said to his disciples. He said, I will call you no more servant, but friend. But actually, in a true sense, of servant is always a servant. But a friend is more than a servant. Right? So you can also be a servant and a friend. Am I right? Right. A good servant can be called a friend. An obedient servant can be called a friend. A humble servant will become a friend. Right? One way you can be Jesus' friend is to be humble, is to be loving, is to be kind. But most of all is to be obedient. That's the key word. Obedience. That's why he said obedience is better than what? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. So then, the question of us this morning. What is the other word for friend? If you do not want to use the word friend, but you mean friend, what is the word that would you use beside friend? If you don't want to use the word friend, but you mean friend, what is the word that would you use? Yeah, and now we have numerous words beside friend, which means friend. B Give me one. Buddy. Okay. <laughs> Buddy. That's good. Buddy. That's a good one. 
<laughs> in fact, that's my last one, <laughs> according to my study. Buddy. Uh, okay, that's, that's a good one. What's the next one? Homie. Hmm? Homie. What? Homie. My homie. Homie. Right, homie. Okay, that's a good one again. Homie. Homeboy. Homeboy. Would you, say, would oh, you well, still mean homie? Go <laughs> I'm going too <laughs> far. Same thing. Okay, yeah, you have numbers, numerous of them. Partner. 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 Hmm? Partner. Padro. Padro, that's, that's Spanish. No, he's, he said partner. Partner. Oh, okay, partner. What about mutual friend? M mutual friend. Very close. <laughs> okay, we, 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 I think we have some more. I, I, I call each other. Sister. Sister. Brother. Uh, can you say affectionate, affectionate helper? A helper My can be a dog. friend too. My road dog. Cronus. Partnership. I see it's a body, which I have body ready. Or sympath sympathizer. And all that is friend. Very close. Now, now this friend is apart from relative or lover. A lover is a friend. That's just a type of friend. But uh, we're talking about friend apart from family or lover. And all these can be mentioned as friend when Jesus is talking about friend. People, you tell your personal business, right? People that are close to your heart. In fact, you claim them to be close to your heart. Though you can have people you claim to be your friend, and on the other hand, they are your enemies. Do you know that? Do you know you can have people, and while you have them close to your heart, and claim that they are your friend, they are not? Anybody answer me? Yeah, you're What right. I'm saying, sometimes you can have people very close yes, to your right. heart. In fact, you open up your heart to them. You tell them all of your secrets, everything, and then they betray you. Right. Yeah, I've had friends like that that I've uh, trusted and uh, given some information to, and then they spill it all over, and the next thing you know, it's a great big old blown out thing when it was something small from the beginning, but by the time they finished talking about it, everybody and their mama was mad. Everybody was mad. Yeah, they kept a the little bit here, a little bit there. So, yeah, that, that happens with, with, with friends and people that call themselves your personal friend. That can happen. Okay. So then uh, that's why Jesus was talking about friend, close friend. He, but the Lord, he knows who were his friend because he knew everything. He knew people that was close to his heart and people he could trust. He knew them. We probably can do that a little bit, but we're not sure. We're not sure. We, we can trust people to be our friend. But when we do check, they're not our friend. You know, yes, bro. You don't need a lot of friends. See, I got one friend. Well, I got associates. And I, got, I got a couple of friends, but... I learned through the years having a lot of social friends like that is not good because nine times out of ten, so one, of, one of the five, you got five friends, two out of the five are going to dislike you. Now the other three might like you or it might be vice versa. It might be three out of five that don't like you and the other two like you. So it, it, it's, it's rough when you're dealing with people because you never know what's on their mind. Okay. Now, before I get down to verse 16, I want to run back up to verse 13, when the Lord said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life 
for his friend. Now we're talking about love. 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 But we more or less emphasizing on the agape love. Because you know they have either three or four types of love. But the greatest love is the agape love, which means divine love, which is the love of God. Right? Right. We can depend upon the love of God because this one does not make mistake. That's a love that remains. It cannot lie because it is from God and God cannot lie. Then we go back down to verse 16 and that's where we're going to spend a little time, verse 16 and 17 before we close. He said in verse 16, Ye have not chosen me, or you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever he shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it you or give it to you. Now, pastors lay hands on people and ordain them. In fact, sometimes many pastors lay hands on people or ministers in the line of ordination. I can speak about that because I know. Because I remember in one of my ordination, around 11 pastors lay hands on me. When I was ordaining in my second ordination, or probably, yeah, my secret is my, because I ordained twice, one as a minister and one as a pastor. And uh, I had 11 hands to lay, lay on me when praying for me. Now, if we study the book clearly, we will learn the danger of ordaining people. The Bible tells you, be careful not to lay hands. Hmm? Do not lay hands suddenly upon any man. That's right. Do not lay hands suddenly on any man and not allow everyone to lay hands on you. You've got to be careful. Now, it is in the, in, in the New Testament. Do you remember where it is, Brother Craig? Where it's mentioned? I'm sorry. Do you remember what is in what verse, in what chapter? Is? I think it's some years. <laughs> I no, I don't memorize. I didn't, I didn't look it up. I didn't look it up to, to, to bring it out this morning. But uh, the Bible talk about it. And that's why we have to be very careful on the line of ordination. And uh, you have to know the quality before you lay hands on people. Today we find that people just catching people, whether in the street or anywhere, and put hands on them and ordain them and put them in office. That's the wrong thing to do. That's why we have so much trouble in this world today. And we don't speak much about that. But we as ministers, we must study the word and preach word like this. They are very important. I found it. They have, yes, you find it? It's 1 Timothy 5, 22 through 24. Okay. It is spoken in, in Timothy, but also in another, in another word. But in us tell about that. Talk about, yeah, where Paul was talking to Timothy on the line of on, on the line of ordination, because ordination is uh, a great thing. But then I bring it up to talk about. Uh, the church and the Lord, the Lord is ordination. Before anyone have ordained. You, as a minister, the Lord 
ordain you according to your calling. Some people, I tell you, some people get up and run, and the Lord didn't call them. And that's why we have so much trouble in this world today, especially when it comes to the ministry. Because everyone that are born again should have a gift. Sometimes you have more than one gift. Sometimes you have many gifts, right? You have many gifts. Sometimes you have the fivefold ministry. Oh, praise God. And uh, can do many things when it comes to the things of God. But then it is important to have that anointing on you or the ordination of God on you. That's when God touch you. But the Lord explained it uh, even in the Old Testament when the Lord had to ordain David or even when he had to ordain, ordain, ordain uh, Paul which was called Saul one time. When Saul had to be ordain, ordained when uh, the people of Israel asked for a king you remember when they asked for a king because there were prophets, which was Samuel was the prophet at that time. And the people of Israel got jealous of what had happened on the other side of them because every other nation had a king. But they didn't have a king, they had prophets in that time. And they cry out to God for a king. Samuel felt bad about it. Knowing they didn't want him anymore. To rule over them. They want a king to rule over them. So Samuel felt bad about it. And he cried to God about it. Of what was happening. And Saul and the Lord told Samuel, don't worry. They didn't hurt you. They hurt me. They didn't make you feel bad. They make me feel bad. Go ahead and do what they ask for. Give them a king. And that happened when they ordained, they chose the king they wanted. Because Samuel, not Samuel, but Saul was a tall man. Handsome, strong, and they think he had equality as a king. But the quality of a person is not who you can see. Get me plain now, church. Now, uh, remember we're talking about we're talking about the vine. I don't forget where we are. We're talking about love. I'm talking about choosing, choosing. You don't choose actually the man that you can see. That's why we should not choose. We should allow the Lord to choose for us. Right? Let the Lord choose for you. Don't go choosing for yourself. I can remember even when I wanted a wife. I didn't, I didn't just choose a wife. In my sleep, in fact, we was working in that French country, I remember, and uh, in my sleep, I was praying and, and didn't know in my sleep. When I got up in the morning, the guys that I used to work with tell me, but you was praying last night, all night you was praying. I used to pray in my sleep, especially when I think I reach the age where I need a wife and I was praying I, and asked the Lord to bless me with a wife. Because by then I was a Christian and I, and I wanted to live a life pleasing to God. So then I, I was praying. And they told me what I was praying in the night. Because I prayed for a wife, I remember. I didn't just choose one. And it's important when you pray and ask God for what you want. And be careful that you don't, 
you tell him exactly what you want. If he's your friend, then talk to him and explain to him the type that you need. Now, uh, I'm not sure if the people of Israel did that. If they explained to the Lord the king that he needed. Probably they would have got the king that he needed. Or if they had waited on him, he would have given them exactly what they want. But uh, they got a king, but they get a coward king. One that would run and hide when he ought to serve. If we study the Bible, we'll see that. While they're looking for Saul to serve, he was among the things hiding. Among some shrubs or something hiding when he ought to be serving or take up his position, take up his post. They had to look for him and find him hiding somewhere because he was afraid. Not only that, when he's supposed to go to war. But wait on Samuel. He take over. Because he got afraid. And think that the enemy was going to destroy him and his people. He did not wait on Samuel the prophet. To pray or to do what he had to do before war. But he went and he was sacrificed. He kill what animals he had to kill and do all what he had to do getting ready for war because he think that Samuel was late. That Samuel take too long to come. The time he said he was coming and he said the time getting very close and like the enemy coming at him. So he decided to do the sacrifice or do what he had to do before that time. And when Samuel comes, Samuel see him right in the middle of it or probably just complete. And Samuel asked him what are you doing? And he said well the enemy was coming on me. Yes bro. Hold on. The enemy was coming on me so then I had to go out and do what I do. Um, I, I remember in Psalms it said that I gave you a king in my anger. In, I gave you the king you wanted and in my anger I took him away from you. Um, God had chosen Saul, but God knew that Saul couldn't do it, do what he was supposed to do right. So you also have to be careful what you pray for. <laughs> okay. They asked for a king, but they didn't, they didn't pay attention to the details. Okay. Now, uh, also, could I say ahead, one more thing? Ahead, talk with, um, talk also, they weren't mixing it with faith because they had prophets who always taught them the right things and showed them the right paths. And still they asked for a king as if the prophets weren't enough. And the Lord Jesus wanted to be their king from heaven and rule through the prophets. And they just didn't have any faith that he would be able to do it, even though he had brought them from so far. So I think it's also a story that we need to be careful and remember where God has brought us from and to see his hand in all that he's done in our lives because we can forget that he is our king. Amen. Okay, if uh, nobody else has anything else to say, then uh, talking about answers, answers to your requests, answers to your requests. Now, there are two types of answers to your request. One is called direct answer. And, one is, and the other one is called... Uh, somebody help me. I can't remember the name. Two one is direct answer. And pro one is promis promissive. Promissive will. Promissive, or talking about will. Promissive and direct. There's a direct will and there's a promissive will. Promissive will is when you keep on bothering the Lord. You keep on troubling him for what you want. 
You keep on asking him over and over. And sometimes he might tell you, hold on. Wait on me. But you keep on every day. And you might even go so far and say, Lord, come what may, Lord, I need it. And he will permit you whatever you ask for. That's what happened to Israel concerning Paul, Saul. He gave them that permissive will or answer. But there is a direct answer and permissive answer. So the permissive answer, sometimes it work, but sometimes it work and it hurt you. Sometimes it hurt you because that's not what the Lord meant for you. But that's what you ask him for. So that's why he said, I have not, you have not chosen me, but I choose you. When you choose something, you're not 100% certain if it is right. But when the Lord chooses you, he knows you. Because he created you. He knows all about you. Okay, we're going to stop now. So we are talking about uh, choose and ordain. Choose and ordain. Our time moves so fast on us there. Okay, we are we are above one minute, right? Or oh, five minutes? It's uh, 10.45. Huh? It's 10.45. It's a quarter to 10 11. 10.45, okay. Okay. So next week we'll... Uh, yes. We'll just close up uh, 16 and 17. Now, because I observe we don't, we don't get very fine as verses, but it comes so quick on us. Let me realize that. Okay, so then we talking about, we talk about ordination, which you understand what is ordination, right? To lay hands on you and pray for you and uh, search you. But I would encourage us to look into the book of uh, Timothy. Was it Second Timothy, Brother Craig? First uh, Timothy five twenty-two. Okay. Now we need to look at that and see uh, who are the ones uh, that should be ordained, or who the pastor should be really ordained. What quality should you look for in ordaining people? That's right. It's right there. So then we look at that and. Never read one verse, as I always encourage us. Never read one verse. Read four, five, six verses so you can understand what you're reading. One verse cannot help you. Not very much. But when you read five verses, you digest it. Go back. Go back. And go forward. Look for the pre- and for the completion. If you understand what I'm trying to say. You look for pretext and context. And the middle is called text, right? It's pretext, text, and context. When you get into the free. Now, even the middle one, which is called text, you can even skip that if you want to. But make sure you know why. And then you could say, woo, woo, which means, oh, I know now, right? You can only say, I know now, at the end of it. But the beginning, it is important to know why it was placed in, a, in action. You should know why it was placed in action. And you should know the completion. It's like, a love, it's like a love letter, as I always say. Unless you get the end of a love letter, you finish the last word that person say, you haven't got nothing. You need to know the last word. And you want to know why the letter was written to you. Do we get that? So when you get those things, then that's the only way you can understand what happened, why you are in the middle of it. 
and why it ends. It's important. Father, we thank you for the lesson. The Lord, we know that we didn't go very far, but we thank you, God, that you have blessed us.